Chapter 19 of Memory, How to Develop, Train, and Use It. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Memory, How to Develop, Train, and Use It by William Walker Atkinson. Chapter 19. How to Remember Books, Plays, Tales, Etc. In the preceding chapters we have given you suggestions for the development of the principal forms of memory, but there are still other phases or forms of memory which, while coming under the general classification, may be still considered as worthy of special consideration. For instance, there may be suggestions given regarding the memorization of the contents of the books you read, the stories you hear, etc., and so we have thought it advisable to devote one chapter to a consideration of these various phases of memory that have been left out of the other chapters. Many of us fail to remember the important things in the books we read, and are often mortified by our ignorance regarding the contents of the works of leading authors, or of popular novels, which, although we have read, we have failed to impress upon the records of our memory. Of course, we must begin by reminding you of the ever-present necessity of interest and attention. We cannot escape from these principles of the memory. The trouble with the majority of people is that they read books to kill time, as a sort of mental narcotic or anesthetic, instead of for the purpose of obtaining something of interest from them. By this course, we not only lose all that may be of importance or value in the book, but also acquire the habit of careless reading and inattention. The prevalence of the habit of reading many newspapers and trashy novels is responsible for the apparent inability of many persons to intelligently absorb and remember the contents of a book worthwhile when they do happen to take up such a one. But still, even the most careless reader may improve himself and cure the habit of inattention and careless reading. Noah Porter says, We have not read an author till we have seen his object, whatever it may be, as he saw it. Also, read with attention. This is the rule that takes precedence of all others. It stands instead of a score of minor directions. Indeed, it comprehends them all, and is the golden rule. The page should be read as if it were never to be seen a second time. The mental eye should be fixed as if there were no other object to think of. The memory should grasp the facts like a vice. The impressions should be distinctly and sharply received. It is not necessary, nor is it advisable, to attempt to memorize the text of a book excepting, perhaps, a few passages that may seem worthy to be treasured up word for word. The principal thing to be remembered about a book is its meaning, what it is about. Then may follow the general outline and the details of the story, essay, treatise, or whatever it may be. The question that should be asked oneself, after the book is completed, or after the completion of some particular part of the book, is, what was the writer's idea? What did he wish to say? Get the idea of the writer. By taking this mental attitude, you practically place yourself in the place of the writer, and thus take part in the idea of the book. You thus view it from the inside, rather than from the outside. You place yourself at the center of the thing, instead of upon its circumference. If the book be a history, biography, autobiography, narrative, or story of fact or fiction, you will find it of value to visualize its occurrences as the story unfolds. That is, endeavor to form at least a faint mental picture of the events related, so that you can see them in your mind's eye or imagination. Use your imagination in connection with the mechanical reading. In this way you build up a series of mental pictures which will be impressed upon your mind, and which will be remembered just as are the scenes of a play that you have witnessed, or an actual event that you have seen, 
only less distinct, of course. Particularly you should endeavor to form a clear mental picture of each character, until each one is endowed with at least a semblance of reality to you. By doing this, you will impart a naturalness to the events of the story, and you will obtain a new pleasure from your reading. Of course, this plan will make you read more slowly, and many trashy tales will cease to interest you, for they do not contain the real elements of interest, but this is no loss, but is a decided gain for you. At the end of each reading, take the time to mentally review the progress of the story. Let the characters and scenes pass before your mental vision as in a moving picture. And when the book is finally completed, review it as a whole. By following this course, you will not only acquire the habit of easily remembering the tales and books that you have read, but will also obtain much pleasure by rereading favorite stories in your imagination years after. You will find that your favorite characters will take on a new reality for you, and will become as old friends in whose company you may enjoy yourself at any time, and whom you may dismiss when they tire you without offense. In the case of scientific treatises, essays, etc., you may follow a similar plan by dividing the work into small sections and mentally reviewing the thought, not the words, of each section until you make it your own, and then, by adding new sections to your review, you may gradually absorb and master the entire work. All this requires time, work, and patience but you will be repaid for your expenditure. You will find that this plan will soon render you impatient at books of little consequence, and will drive you to the best books on any given subject. You will begin to begrudge your time and attention, and hesitate about bestowing them upon any but the very best books. But in this you gain. In order to fully acquaint yourself with a book, before reading it, you should familiarize yourself with its general character. To do this, you should pay attention to the full title and the subtitle, if there be any, the name of the author and the list of other books that he has written, if they are noted on the title page, or the one preceding it, according to the usual custom. You should read the preface and study carefully the table of contents, that you may know the field or general subject covered by the book. In other words, endeavor to get the general outline of the book, into which you may afterwards fill in the details. In reading a book of serious import, you should make it a point to fully grasp the meaning of each paragraph before passing on to the next one. Let nothing pass you that you do not understand, at least in a general way. Consult the dictionary for words not familiar to you, so that you may grasp the full idea intended to be expressed. At the end of each chapter, section, and part, you should review that which you have read until you are able to form a mental picture of the general ideas contained therein. To those who wish to remember the dramatic productions that they have attended, we would say that the principles above mentioned may be applied to this form of memory as well as to the memory of books. By taking an interest in each character as it appears, by studying carefully each action and scene, and then reviewing each act in the intervals between the acts, and by finally reviewing the entire play after your return home, you will fasten the whole play as a complete mental picture on the records of your memory. If you have acquainted yourself with what we have just said regarding the recollection of the contents of books, you will be able to modify and adapt them to the purpose of recollecting plays and dramatic productions. You will find that the oftener you review a play, the more clearly you will remember it. Many little details overlooked at first will come into the field of consciousness and fit into their proper places. Sermons, lectures, and other discourses may be remembered by bestowing interest and attention upon them, 
and by attempting to grasp each general idea advanced and by noting the passage from one general idea to another if you will practice this a few times you will find that when you come to review the discourse and this you should always do it is the natural way of developing memory the little details will come up and fit into their proper places in this form of memory the important thing is to train the memory by exercise and review you will find that at each review of a discourse you will have made progress by practice and exercise the subconscious mentality will do better work and will show that it is rising to its new responsibilities you have allowed it to sleep during the many discourses to which you have listened and it must be taught new habits let it know that it is expected to retain that which it hears and then exercise it frequently by reviews of discourses and you will be surprised at the degree of the work it will perform for you not only will you remember better but you will hear better and more intelligently the subconsciousness knowing that it will be called upon later on to recollect what is being said will urge you to bestow the attention necessary to supply it with the proper material to those who have had trouble in remembering discourses we urge that they should begin to attend lectures and other forms of discourse with the distinct purpose of developing that form of memory give to the subconscious mentality the positive command that it shall attend to what is being said and shall record the same in such a way that when you review the discourse afterward you will be presented with a good synopsis or syllabus of it you should avoid any attempt to memorize the words of the discourse your purpose being to absorb and record the ideas and general thoughts expressed interest attention practice review these are the important points in memory to remember stories anecdotes fables etc the principles given above are to be employed the main thing in memorizing an anecdote is to be able to catch the fundamental idea underlining it and the epigrammatic sentence or central phrase which forms the point of the story be sure that you catch these perfectly and then commit the point to memory if necessary make a memorandum of the point until you have opportunity to review the story in your mind then carefully review it mentally letting the mental image of the idea pass before you in review and then repeating it to yourself in your own words by rehearsing and reviewing the story you make it your own and will be able to relate it afterward just as you would something that you had actually experienced so true is this principle that when carried too far it endows the story with a false sense of actuality who has not known men who told a story so often that they came actually to believe it themselves do not carry the principle to this extreme but use it in moderation the trouble with many men is that they attempt to repeat a tale long after they have heard it without reviewing or rehearsing in the meantime consequently they omit many important points because they have failed to impress the story as a whole upon the memory in order to know an anecdote properly one should be able to see its characters and incidents just as he does when he sees an illustrated joke in a comic paper if you can make a mental picture of an anecdote you will be apt to remember it with ease the noted storytellers review and rehearse their jokes and have been known to try them on their unsuspecting friends in order to get the benefit of practice before relating them in public this practice has been called by flippant people trying it on the dog but it has its good points and advantages it at least saves one the mortification of being compelled to finish up a long drawn-out tale by uh well uh 
I'm afraid I've forgotten just how that story ended, but it was a good one. End of chapter 19「Chapter Twenty of Memory: How to Develop, Train, and Use It. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Memory: How to Develop, Train, and Use It by William Walker Atkinson. Chapter Twenty: General Instructions. In this chapter, we shall call your attention to certain of the general principles already mentioned in the preceding chapters for the purpose of further impressing them upon your mind, and in order that you may be able to think of and to consider them independent of the details of the special phases of memory. This chapter may be considered in the nature of a general review of certain fundamental principles mentioned in the body of the work. Point 1. Give to the things that you wish to memorize as great a degree of concentrated attention as possible. We have explained the reason for this advice in many places in the book. The degree of concentrated attention bestowed upon the object under consideration determines the strength, clearness, and depth of the impression received and stored away in the subconsciousness. The character of these stored-away impressions determines the degree of ease in remembrance and recollection. Point 2. In considering an object to be memorized, endeavor to obtain the impressions through as many faculties and senses as possible. The reason for this advice should be apparent to you, if you have carefully read the preceding chapters. An impression received through both sound and sight is doubly as strong as one received through but one of these channels. You may remember a name or word either by having seen it in writing or print or else by reason of having heard it, but if you have both seen and heard it, you have a double impression and possess two possible ways of reviving the impression. You are able to remember an orange by reason of having seen it, smelt it, felt it and tasted it, and having heard its name pronounced. Endeavor to know a thing from as many sense impressions as possible. Use the eye to assist ear impressions, and the ear to assist in eye impressions. See the thing from as many angles as possible. Point 3. Sense impressions may be strengthened by exercising the particular faculty through which the weak impressions are received. You will find that either your eye memory is better than your ear memory, or vice versa. The remedy lies in exercising the weaker faculty, so as to bring it up to the standard of the stronger. The chapters of eye and ear training will help you along these lines. The same rule applies to the several phases of memory. Develop the weak ones, and the strong ones will take care of themselves. The only way to develop a sense or faculty is to intelligently train, exercise, and use it. Use, exercise, and practice will work miracles in this direction. Point 4. Make your first impression strong and firm enough to serve as a basis for subsequent ones. Get into the habit of fixing a clear, strong impression of a thing to be considered from the first. Otherwise, you are trying to build up a large structure upon a poor foundation. Each time you revive an impression, you deepen it. But if you have only a dim impression to begin with, the deepened impressions will not include details omitted in the first one. It is like taking a good sharp negative of a picture that you intend to enlarge afterward. The details lacking in the small picture will not appear in the enlargement, but those that do appear in the small one will be enlarged with the picture. Point 5. Revive your impressions frequently and thus deepen them. You will know more of a picture by seeing it a few minutes every day for a week than you would by spending several hours before it at one time. So it is with the memory. By recalling an impression a number of times, 
you fix it indelibly in your mind in such a way that it may be readily found when needed. Such impressions are like favorite tools which you need every little while. They are not apt to be mislaid as are those which are but seldom used. Use your imagination in going over a thing that you wish to remember. If you are studying a thing, you will find that this going over in your imagination will help you materially in disclosing the things that you have not remembered about it. By thus recognizing your weak points of memory, you may be able to pick up the missing details when you study the object itself the next time. Point six. Use your memory and place confidence in it. One of the important things in the cultivation of the memory is the actual use of it. Begin to trust it a little, and then more, and then still more, and it will rise to the occasion. The man who has to tie a string around his finger in order to remember certain things soon begins to cease to use his memory, and in the end forgets to remember the string, or what it is for. There are many details, of course, with which it is folly to charge the memory, but one should never allow his memory to fall into disuse. If you are in an occupation in which the work is done by mechanical helps, then you should exercise the memory by learning verses or other things in order to keep it in active practice. Do not allow your memory to atrophy. Point 7. Establish as many associations for an impression as possible. If you have studied the preceding chapters, you will recognize the value of this point. Association is memory's method of indexing and cross-indexing. Each association renders it easier to remember or recollect the thing. Each association gives you another string to your mental bow. Endeavor to associate a new bit of knowledge with something already known by and familiar to you. In this way, to avoid the danger of having the thing isolated and alone in your mind, without a label or index number and name, connect your object or thought to be remembered with other objects or thoughts by the association of contiguity in space and time and by relationship of kind, resemblance, or oppositeness. Sometimes the latter is very useful, as in the case of the man who said that, Smith reminds me so much of Brown, he's so different. You will often be able to remember a thing by remembering something else that happened at the same place, or about the same time. These things give you the loose ends of recollection whereby you may unwind the ball of memory. In the same way, one is often able to recollect names by slowly running over the alphabet with a pencil until the sight of the capital first letter of the name brings the memory of those following it. This, however, only when the name has previously been memorized by sight. In the same way, the first few notes of a musical selection will enable you to remember the whole air, or the first words of a sentence, the entire speech or selection following it. In trying to remember a thing which has escaped you, you will find it helpful to think of something associated with that thing, even remotely. A little practice will enable you to recollect the thing along the lines of the faintest association or clue. Some men are adept memory detectives following this plan. The loose end in memory is all the expert requires. Any associations furnish these loose ends? An interesting and important fact to remember in this connection is that if you have some one thing that tends to escape your memory, you may counteract the trouble by noting the associated things that have previously served to bring it into mind with you. The associated thing, once noted, may thereafter be used as a loose end with which to unwind the elusive fact or impression. This idea of association is quite fascinating when you begin to employ it in your memory exercises and work. 
and you will find many little methods of using it. But always use natural association, and avoid the temptation of endeavoring to tie your memory up with the red tape of the artificial systems. Point 8. Group your impressions. This is but a form of association, but is very important. If you can arrange your bits of knowledge and fact into logical groups, you will always be master of your subject. By associating your knowledge with other knowledge along the same general lines, both by resemblances and by opposites, you will be able to find what you need just when you need it. Napoleon Bonaparte had a mind trained along these lines. He said that his memory was like a large case of small drawers and pigeonholes, in which he filed his information according to its kind. In order to do this, he used the methods mentioned in this book of comparing the new thing with the old ones, and then deciding into which group it naturally fitted. This is largely a matter of practice and knack, but it may be acquired by a little thought and care aided by practice, and it will repay one well for the trouble in acquiring it. The following table will be found useful in classifying objects, ideas, facts, etc., so as to correlate and associate them with other facts of a like kind. The table is to be used in the line of questions addressed to oneself regarding the thing under consideration. It somewhat resembles the table of questions given in chapter 17 of this book, but has the advantage of brevity. Memorize this table and use it. You will be delighted at the results after you have caught the knack of applying it. Query Table Ask yourself the following questions regarding the thing under consideration. It will draw out many bits of information and associated knowledge in your mind. 1. What? 2. Whence? 3. Where? 4. When? 5. How? 6. Why? 7. Whither? While the above seven queries are given you as a means of acquiring clear impressions and associations, they will also serve as a magic key to knowledge, if you use them intelligently. If you can answer these questions regarding anything, you will know a great deal about that particular thing. And after you have answered them fully, there will be but little unexpressed knowledge regarding that thing left in your memory. Try them on one thing. You cannot understand them otherwise, unless you have a very good imagination. Fini. End of chapter 20. End of Memory, How to Develop, Train, and Use It by William Walker Atkinson. This recording has been by Roger Moline.